The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. first reading is from the 51st chapter of Isaiah. Just as God had called Abraham and Sarah and given them many descendants, so now God offers comfort to Zion. God's deliverance will come soon and will never end. A reading from Isaiah. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the 12th chapter of Romans. In response to God's merciful activity, we are to worship by living holistic, God-pleasing lives. Our values and viewpoints are not molded by the time in which we live, but are transformed by the Spirit's renewing work. God's grace empowers different forms of service among Christians, but all forms of ministry function to build up the body of Christ. A reading from Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, 
the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us sing responsibly Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples, not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. My friends, grace to you and peace from God the Father Almighty and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to take just a brief moment to give a special greeting to the congregations of Lorain County who on this Sunday, under normal circumstances, would have been gathered together outdoors along with our Episcopal sisters and brothers at our annual worship in the park at the High Meadows picnic area in Illyria. In my years as bishop, this has been one of the highlights of my summer. Sadly, this year, because of the coronavirus, this will not take place. But please know how special this occasion has been for me, and I pray that in the years to come, you'll be able to resume that meaningful and joyful celebration to the glory of God and creation. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have called us 
to be your church and to witness to your grace. Through your word, remind us of your eternal love and your healing mercy. Make us ready to live the gospel and eager to do your will. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This Gospel reading for this twelfth Sunday after Pentecost is also the Gospel reading for the Festival of the Confession of Peter, which falls on January 18th each year and begins the week of prayer for Christian unity. That was the date of my ordination, so this reading has much personal meaning for me because it was the Gospel read that day. This reading is highlighted by a series of questions. Jesus casually asks the disciples, Who do people say I am? The reply came, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, because it was believed that Elijah would return, while others say Jeremiah, the prophet of gloom and doom, or some other prophet. The disciples had witnessed Jesus work miracles, feed multitudes, heal the sick, raise the dead, drive out demons. They had listened carefully when he taught about the kingdom of God. They were first-hand witnesses. Jesus knew that others were guessing as to who this man from Nazareth really was. But Jesus wasn't interested in what others thought of him. He got straight to the point. What about you? Jesus asked the disciples. Who do you think that I am? This question is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Throughout history, various individuals have attempted to answer that question posed by Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, referred to Jesus as the man for others. There's a musical drama popular around the season of Lent that answers this question by saying that Jesus was a superstar. It's one of my favorite musicals, by the way. The Gospel writers also attempted in their own fashion to answer this most fundamental question. They bestowed upon him numerous titles and claims, Son of God, Son of Man, Divine Physician, King, Prophet, Bridegroom, Light of the World, the Door, the Vine, High Priest, the Firstborn of Creation, the Bright and Morning Star, the Alpha and Omega. All of these were attempts to answer this question posed by Jesus. But these are attempts made by others. Jesus is more concerned what your answer is than what their answer is. Martin Luther wrote, and I quote, I care not whether he be Christ, but that he be Christ for you. In this passage, we hear Jesus asking a personal question of us. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks each one of us, what is your personal opinion of me and my identity? I'm not interested in what your church says or what your pastor says or even what your friends say. I'm interested in what you think and say about me. What are your personal conclusions about me? So I pose to you this morning, or whenever you may be watching this broadcast, the same question. Who do you say Jesus is? I would suggest to you that this is the most important, the most urgent, the most relevant, the most essential question that confronts us today. Wherever we turn in life, we are faced with the implications of this question. You see, the church no longer occupies the position of authority and prominence that it once had in our American society. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were far many more people in bed or walking their dogs on Sunday morning than in Sunday school or in church. The church has been in a constant struggle against those who do not believe, against those who do not know who Jesus is. We in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America are no different than the majority of mainline denominational churches today. Whenever we gather for worship under normal circumstances, the majority of our congregations average fewer than 100 people per Sunday. As a denomination, the Lutheran Church is older and grayer. Now, there may be many reasons for why the Church is in this situation throughout the nation, but it seems to me 
that one key reason is that we insist on living a disconnect between what we say about Jesus and what we say about ourselves. In other words, do we really live out what we say we believe? In this day and age, especially in this day and age, it's important to remember that who the church is cannot be separated from who Jesus is. And, and that is the message that our gospel lesson demonstrates to us today. In our gospel lesson, Peter responded, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What makes this answer so astounding? Well, let's look at this reading a little closer. Jesus and his disciples were in the district of Caesarea Philippi, an area about 25 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee. The region had tremendous religious implications. The place was littered with the temples of the Syrian gods. Here also was the elaborate marble temple that had been elected by Herod the Great, father of the then ruling Herod Antipas. Here also was the influence of the Greek gods. Here also was the worship of Caesar as God himself. You might say that the, the world religions were on display in this town. It was with this scene in the background that Jesus chose to ask the most crucial question of his ministry. Who do you say that I am? What makes Peter's answer so different than all the rest is this. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. To Peter, Jesus is alive. All these other people mentioned, John the Baptist, Elijah, and Jeremiah, are dead, even if some believe that Elijah was still lurking around somewhere. To Peter, Jesus is none of these. He is human and divine. By the very nature of where Jesus asks this question is another more central, more prominent, more important issue. Who rules? Herod Philip, Caesar, or Jesus? Who is the Lord of your life? Who do you say that I am? Many of us Lutherans are uncomfortable talking about Jesus in the present tense. We Lutheran preachers share a lot of blame in that. You can't tell from a lot of Lutheran sermons that border on lectures or speeches whether Jesus is living or is really alive and, and present in the church right here and right now. Earlier in this sermon, I told you what a lot of dead people said about Jesus. Today, Matthew poses for us Jesus' question for both pastors and parishioners. Jesus asks, not merely do you think I'm alive. Jesus wants to know, am I the living Lord of your life? Could it be that some scholar, some mentor, some friend, or, or even some loved one has more authority over you than Jesus? Who do you say that I am? Confessing Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, may be easy within the walls of the church building. But are you willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God, the Son of the living God, at work or at school or in the mall? Or, or do you want to stay merely within the safe confines of your church community on Sunday? We feel safe talking about Jesus here. But what about the grocery store, or a restaurant, or a government building, or at work? Would we dare ask the people about Jesus in those locations? How do we confess our faith when we are at the many other places where we're confronted by signs and symbols of other gods like materialism, greed, and so forth? Perhaps then we could make a clearer contrast between the Son of the Living God and the places and people serving dead idols. It can be and it is more difficult to believe in the power of the living God when we're surrounded by indications of contrary powers and authorities. Who do you say that I am? You know, during the seemingly endless presidential election campaign, we seem to be making a big deal about the faith of our political candidates we hear often in the news as to how many evangelicals voted for a particular candidate thinking that the church gives advantage to one over the other, or that being a Christian makes you better than someone of another religious faith. Politicians want to use the name of Jesus 
as a token of power. Some even have their photos taken in front of churches holding a Bible in their hands. It may not be the only factor, but a lot of voters will be making their decisions based on what the candidates say regarding their faith. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is still asking the question to you and me. Who do you say Jesus is? Is Jesus your Messiah or just some guy that lived 2,000 years ago? Is Jesus indeed the living Lord of your life or a fellow whose name you mention on occasion, sometimes not in very flattering terms? My friends, we are valuable to Jesus, but for whatever reason, we are unwilling or unable to realize it or share it. Without a sense of who Jesus is for you, Life is just something that happens to you while you're busy making other plans, to echo John Lennon. There are many people whom you encounter on a daily basis who don't know who Jesus is. Can you tell them? Do your words or your actions reflect the presence of Christ in your life? Who do you say that I am? Over the course of the last several weeks, I've been in discussions with several congregations who are debating when or whether to resume in-person public worship and how to go about it. We have a page, by the way, dedicated to that issue on our Northeastern Ohio Synod website. But one of the questions that I ask these congregations is why? What is the reason that you want to gather together again? I ask, because if you are not clear about the why, then the how becomes quite complicated. We can talk about the mechanics of in-person worship all we want, wearing masks and physical distancing and not singing and not sharing the peace and not having coffee hour. But without a sense of who Jesus is for you, without a sense of the why we gather, church is just another social club and a dying one at that, with no other purpose than to get together on Sunday morning. My friends, Jesus is the why. Jesus is what makes us different. Jesus is what keeps us alive. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is present here and now to ask the question, how will you respond? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us read together the Apostles' Creed. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips remember those that have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settled in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. Let us pray. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, our son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wonderful world you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the heavens and earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators and magistrates, mayors and councils to walk in your way. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy and fulfill your loving purposes in the governance of people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. And according to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved, in trouble or adversity, sick or in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us into this community, Trinity Lutheran Church, in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts that you have given us for the building up of the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your spirit be the guide as our call committee works to find the next pastor in Trinity. Support our seated partners, our call committee members, and those pastors who we will eventually meet and consider for ministry among us. Let your love guide us and sustain us in this journey, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving God, even as our face-to-face -face conversations are limited or impossible, be a part of our online conversations, meetings, and discussions. Increase in us the awareness of your presence in these conversations. Help us to trust in your gifts to us, gifts of faith, hope, and love. May we use these gifts in our discernment. May we increasingly rely on the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst so that we may know the difference between our opinions and your will for our synod. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We rejoice in the baptismal anniversaries of Ray Lebenguth and Tristan Lebenguth, John Huffman and Ed Smith. We thank you for the youth in this congregation and community, especially today for Tamlin Thomas. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we are hewn, and you restore your people to joy and gladness and blessed memory and hope. We thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to their heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.